Hey, I'm Stephanie, and for the longest time, I've wanted to do some kind of event where I could take my fine art print collection and use it to teach people about the history of the American print renaissance. I figured the COVID quarantine was as good a time as any to try doing a little homemade video instead. So I've broken it up into four mini sessions. The first session's a little bit longer than the others because it has an intro. And then sprinkled throughout are a couple little mini sections that'll help you learn a little bit about the modern art movement. So I have a bunch of really beautiful examples of mid-century and modern art to show you. Here we go. I really do love mid-century modern art. I find it really personally appealing. But printmaking specifically, I think is really interesting because it did a couple of things. First, it really forced artists into a collaborative working environment that had sort of gone away. If you think about the Renaissance painters, uh, like the Italian Renaissance painters, you could picture them sort of in a workshop. They very often would have apprentices that they were training. Um, lots of different artists might be working on the same piece under the direction of one kind of top artist. Well, all that sort of had trickled away in modern times and you kind of, you know, picture more of the individual artist in their own studio by themselves, kind of working on their own inspiration. And what printmaking did is it forced those artists who wanted to take part in the printmaking renaissance to do so sort of in groups because they wouldn't have had the equipment. They would have had to become some, you know, a part of like a workshop where they shared equipment. They wouldn't have had the technical knowledge. So they had to go and find, um, like a print master, a master printer who would either collaborate with them to create their prints, or they would have had to have someone train them, teach them how to do their own printmaking. So it really kind of forced artists into more of a group setting um, to work. And I find that really interesting. And then secondly, the other thing I think is really interesting about printmaking is that it really democratized collecting. As an art collector, I could never afford to purchase um, paintings. And while paintings and numbered original prints are both considered originals, uh, they do not cost the same, not even close. So if you look at an artist like William de Kooning, uh, a painting by him would auction today 10, 20 million maybe, um, but you could auction a, a, a lithograph for maybe a thousand or a couple thousand. So I'm gonna use a lot of my own prints that I have, uh, that I have collected over the years to kind of to show you the history of this time period. Um, there won't be any de Koenigs. I couldn't afford a print or a painting, but hopefully um, this will be an interesting time and you guys will learn a lot. Okay, let's get started. Before we start talking about modern printmaking, I'm going to give you a super fast overview of what came before that. We'll start in China around 105 AD. This is about the time when paper was invented and the paper making industry was really just launching. The first prints on paper were rubbing, so those are made by laying a piece of paper over a textured surface and rubbing it with a pencil or like a crayon. Woodblock printing followed soon after. Woodblocks are a subtractive process where you take a block of wood and you carve away the parts that you don't want ink to print on. In the late Middle Ages, we see woodblock printing making its way from China over to Europe. And by the late 1400s, Albrecht Dürer had really elevated woodblock printing to the height of complexity. Check out this example of Samson fighting the lion. The carved woodblock is on the left and the completed print is on the right. Durer went on to perfect metal engraving techniques as well, and he produced amazingly meticulous work. Now, engravings are made by, say, like you cut lines into a metal plate, and that's what holds and transfers the ink. In the 1600s, Rembrandt created 300 etchings and dry points. He was the first to make prints from the same plate look different from each other. He'd leave different amounts of ink on the plate or he'd ink sections of the plate differently to create more painterly impressions that were vastly different from each other. He would even rework the plate in between impressions, adding or removing characters for a completely new composition. 
In 1796, lithography was invented. Now, lithography is a printing process where you have a flat stone surface and it's treated with oil and water in such a way that the printing ink is repelled in areas that you want to remain unprinted. In the early 1800s, Francisco Goya created aquatint prints. Now, that's a form of etching. And these were really the first important prints to be published in limited editions, but they weren't signed or numbered. At that point, limited editions were forced by the problem that the printing plate degraded over time. It wasn't until the late 1800s when artists began to purposely create limited editions and sign and number their prints. So that brings us up to the beginning of the 20th century. We've talked about some various printing processes in very quick general terms. We've talked about lithography and wood blocks and etchings, and there are a couple of print processes that haven't been invented yet. We'll get to those later. So here we are at the beginning of the 20th century, and Americans are crazy about collecting French prints. Now soon, America will become important in modern art and the modern art movement, but at this point, it's all about what's happening in Paris. So two interesting things are going on in the world of French printing at this time. Beginning in the 20s, these art literary journals start popping up. Prepare for me to butcher some French. Cahiers d'Art in 26, Verve in 37, Chronique du Jour in 38, and Derrière le Miroir in 46. So these featured beautifully printed modern lithographs that were in open edition, so they weren't counted, um, but people could collect these and frame these, and it really popularized modern art. So you have these art literary journals that are popularizing and educating people while mass producing modern art. But on the other side of the coin, you have a lot of individual artists who are getting together and collaborating in these little workshops called ateliers, and they were experimenting with printmaking. One of those experimenters was Picasso. Now, he experimented with printmaking early in his career, but it really wasn't until the 40s and 50s that he was really, really prolific in printmaking. And this happened because he uh, met and befriended a master printer named Morlo. Um, now, there's this great little story, I have no idea if it's true, that the reason that Picasso really got into printmaking so much was that Merlot's studio was heated and his was not. Kind of fun, I don't know if it's true or not, but it's a fun little story. So let's look at our first piece. So I've snuck out of quarantine today so that I can show you this great print at a friend's house. This is a Picasso print and it was featured in one of those art literary journals that I just told you about called Verve. It was a double edition of the journal that featured 180 prints called Picasso and the Human Comedy. Now most of these are unsigned or signed in the plate, which means that the artist would have signed right on the printing plate, and so every signature would be the same. A question I sometimes get asked is, what's the difference between an art poster and an artist's print? An art poster is usually made by taking a photograph of an existing painting or drawing by an artist and then reproducing it in unlimited numbers by photomechanical means. That's the same way that you would print a book or a magazine. An art print is made when the artist creates a work of art on a block of wood or a stone or a screen and then uses that piece to transfer ink onto a piece of paper. Now, each one is usually unique because it's created by hand by the artist or the artist in collaboration with a master printer. Um, after a limited number, say 100, the artist individually signs and numbers each print and then oftentimes the stone or the screen is destroyed to ensure that those are the only pieces that exist. Now the prints that are created for literary journals are somewhere in between those two. They're not usually mass produced by photomechanical means, but they're also not hand signed, hand pulled by the artist and numbered. There are a few things that set New York City up to become important in the modern printmaking and art movement. One was the Art Students League. The Art Students League launched in 1875 and its purpose was to provide affordable art classes for both professionals and amateurs. Now there are so many modern artists 
who became very important, uh, whose names you would recognize, who got their start at the Art Students League in the 1920s and 1930s. Artists like Mark Rothko or Roy Lichtenstein, James Rosenquist, um, Jackson Pollock. But what's even cooler to me is that artists who trained side by side with those guys who didn't go on to become wildly famous and whose names you probably wouldn't recognize, guys like uh, Robert Blackburn or Darrow Antresian or Guy McCoy, um, they went on to do things like invent new printmaking techniques or launch printmaking workshops or become technical directors at important print workshops, write books on printmaking. These guys were really the unsung heroes of the printmaking movement. Another incubator of creativity in New York in the 20s and 30s was Roosevelt's Works Progress Administration. Now there are two WPA funded programs I want to tell you about. The first is the Harlem Community Arts Center and the second is the Graphic Arts Division. Now in the 20s, there was this incredible cultural and artistic renaissance going on in Harlem, and really the Great Depression could have crushed that. One of the things that kept that renaissance alive was the WPA's Harlem Art Center. It created jobs for art instructors and offered classes for young artists who really wouldn't otherwise maybe been able to afford art instruction. And not only art instruction, but also technical training on printmaking equipment. Robert Blackburn, who is probably the most impactful African-American printmaker, got his start at the Harlem Art Center as a teenager. I don't have any Blackburn prints. It's probably one of my top two or three most wanted, but here are a couple I pulled off the internet that he created during this time period, which would have been about the time he was in high school. Now he went on from here to study at the Art Students League on scholarship, and then went on to do other amazing things in the print world that we'll talk about in later sessions. The WPA also funded a group of artists in New York called the Graphic Arts Division. And one of the artists there was named Guy McCoy. Guy started experimenting with silk screening as a fine art medium. Now silk screening is where you press ink through a screen and you stencil out the areas that you don't want to print. Now silk screening had had lots of commercial applications, things like signage and advertising. So convincing people it had artistic value was pretty tough. They started calling the process serigraphy, but even with its awesome new name, those serigraph artists still struggled for legitimacy in the art world. They had this massive breakthrough in 1938 when the Contemporary Art Gallery in New York held its first one-man show of Guy McCoy serigraphs. This is a Guy McCoy print, which is probably the first ever published serigraph. In 1942, the Princeton University Print Club held an exhibition of 40 prints, and a lot of those used the new serigraph technique. They sold for $5 each, and the McCoys were touted as the find of the show. The club then launched an art journal where they included an art print in each issue, and the second print featured was this one. It included the note, it is the belief of the editors that this is the first serigraph to appear in a widely distributed magazine. This is another Guy McCoy from 1943. It's really beautiful. I love all the dynamic movement. It probably has, I think it's like seven or eight colors, which maybe would have been five or six screens. It's not in the best shape, but I really wanted a McCoy from that early, so I'm ignoring all the cracked ink. There are a lot of museums that have Guy McCoy's work, but one of the absolute coolest is at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. They have something really, really unique. A full set of unfinished serigraphs that show what the print looks like in process as each new screen is printed along with Guy's notes. This really gives you an idea of how an artist needs to think differently when they're printmaking than when they're painting. They really have to plan which colors will overlap and think about everywhere a single color will appear in the composition instead of say, working on finishing painting one area and then moving on to the next area. A third important thing going on on the East Coast at this time was a print shop called Atelier 17. It was launched by a British printmaker who had fled the war in Europe in 1940. 
His name was Stanley William Hayter, and Hayter insisted on a communal atmosphere in his workshop, but in a very different way than others. Instead of pairing like a master printer with an artist, he paired artists with artists and insisted that they learn to do their own technical work. Important, well-known, well-established artists would be paired and work side by side with artists who were completely unknown. American artists would work side by side with the European avant-garde artists who had come to America to escape the war. The other thing he demanded was a spirit of experimentation. He wanted an environment where artists could abandon preconceptions, experiment and improvise spontaneously. He really didn't care about popularity or financial gain. He considered those things completely trivial. When you read people's descriptions of Hayter, it's obvious that he was adored. He's described as enthusiastic and open and refreshingly unpretentious. I love that. So just like I described at the Art Students League, the same thing was happening at Atelier 17. It attracted artists who became really super famous in the modern art world. Artists like Robert Motherwell, Salvador Dali, uh, William de Koenig, uh, Mark Rothko, uh, Jack Sam Pollock. And those guys were training side by side with artists who um, didn't become as well known, but became important in the print world. Artists like Kayim Koppelman, who went on to save Robert Blackburn's workshop in the 1950s, or Garo Antresian, who went on to become a top technical director at one of the most important training workshops in the 60s. Now this is another one of those artists that I don't have one to show you. It's in my top couple that I'm searching for. Feel free to buy me one and send it. But here are a couple of his abstract impressionist prints from this time period. This one's from 1944, and this one is from 1949. We're gonna take a quick break from printmaking for a sec and talk about the art movements that were going on during this time. In the late 1800s and early 1900s, as we're ramping up to the American print renaissance, we see a lot of social realism and American realism where artists are showing the everyday activities of ordinary people, mostly in a realistic way. In the 1920s and 30s, we see the rise of surrealism, where artists are exploring the psyche and making irrational things seem real and tangible. About that same time, cubism is very popular in Europe. And that's where instead of painting a subject from one single viewpoint, the artist breaks up the subject into planes and shapes and paints them from different viewpoints. In the 1940s, a lot of artist refugees fled to America. Some because the Nazis had labeled their art degenerate and some because their cities had been destroyed. And those Europeans brought with them a lot of avant-garde ideas, these modernist ideas about tapping into the subconscious. And those ideas began to really influence the art scene in New York. Artists who had started out their careers painting in realism found themselves experimenting more and more with abstraction. So as World War II came to a close, America was bursting with energy. And for artists, that energy found itself expressed through abstraction. Painting became explosive, gestural, bold and loud. Canvases became enormous. Artists wanted to record their raw emotions and the physical movements in their art. So the final image really became more about the process than about a preconceived plan. Out of all of this, abstract expressionism was born. And while the general public was outraged by it, abstract expressionism became America's first international art movement. And it really established New York as the center of the art world. Now printmaking is a medium like charcoal or paint. And so printmakers really just create in whatever style appeals to them. Now, I think printmaking is kind of unique and interesting in that on one hand, it requires all of this technical knowledge. And if you want to represent something specific, you have to really, really pre-plan. But then on the other hand, a lot of printmaking techniques um, you can't really see what you're making while you're making it, so it requires a lot of imagination or a lot of experimentation. 
Um, so that leads to a lot of kind of happy accidents or just the complete abandoning of preconceived notions of what it'll look like and just total experimentation. So while the style of art that you see during the American print renaissance really sort of reflects what was going on in art styles and art movements at the time, it also sort of influenced those movements. I hope that gives you a little bit of a glimpse into what was happening at the beginning of the modern art movement in New York. In the next session, we'll move on to the West Coast and look at printmaking there.